All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the eighth day of September in the year of our Lord, 2020, let's see, four. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, I have a little bit in the dark right here. <laughs> Depends how I set the lights. Uh, I, I can't actually see the camera. I can see the little screen on, screen on top. But yeah, so... Uh, this is Sunday morning, and I'm not going to go to what they call church again. Uh, one of the problems I have is I have been born again. I was I, I was saved. I was born again by God, uh, born of God, born of the Word of God. Uh, the Holy Spirit brought the gospel to me uh, outside of a church structure. And I was actually uh, separated from my home church at the time. Well, I, I wasn't attending that anyway. Now, in fact, I was, where was I? We had moved, and I don't think I went to that church my parents joined more than once or twice. It's like I avoided it. It was dead religion. And I was I was not an unbeliever, um, but I wasn't born again. I wasn't born again, and I wasn't <laughs> following Christ, that's for sure. So, but I, I have uh, remember, and remembered uh, praying many times to, to, to God to, to ask me to ask him that, that I might be able to see things the way he sees them. There are times when I almost wish I hadn't done that. Because it is, talk about being red-pilled, okay? God does answer prayers that are according to his will. And if the whole, why would he want to not see things the way he sees things, right? Other than it makes us personally uncomfortable. Tough. Tough. The, the, the fundamental sinfulness of humanity is self-centeredness. So if your religion is about what is making you feel happy, well, like, John Piper's stuff, uh, his Christian hedonism, that is not Christianity at all. It's paganism. It is the sinfulness of man expressed in religion. And oh, one of the things that's become obvious, well, what God is sort of showing me in a way, or causing me to see, is, is the absolute pervasiveness of sin in humanity, and in everything humanity creates. It's all sinful. It's like democracy. It is a product of sinful humanity. The American Revolution was a product of sinful humanity. Self-interest. And what that always, because it's, it's self-centeredness, it is always the tyranny of the individual. You want to impose your will on everybody else, including God. Now, you may restrain that, but it's there. You want your way. And that is only uh, moderated when you're born again. It's still present in your flesh. Sin still like uh, dwells in your mortal body. I'm going to try to complete my thoughts before changing it there. Paul said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, what I received from Adam by natural birth. That's what he's talking about. No good thing dwells. And Jesus Christ, when uh, he was queried by a person when he was traveling, he said, um, 
uh, good master, what what should I do to inherit the kingdom of God, I believe? And Jesus replied, why do you call me good? There's none good but God alone. He wasn't denying his goodness. He was probing. So why did you say good master? It was actually an assertion of his deity. But So he says, why do you call me good? He wants to know what's going on in the man or what the man, he wants the man to know what's going on in the man. In other words, he's crying about, who do you say that I am? Would be another way to say it. Remember that when he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Because they said, well, some say you're this and some say that, but who do you say that I am? When you call me good. There's none good but God alone. True. Because God is the source of all that is good. And if you're independent of God, separated from God, alienated from God, no good thing dwells in you. And humanity, all the descendants of Adam, are in that state. And because God is not in you, there is no good in you, and therefore, only thing in you is self and your self-interest and your self-will. And you put yourself above everything outside of yourself, unless it is for your own advantage. Psychology and sociology both agree with that. People act out of self-interest. Only when you're born again and God himself dwells in you, can you actually do what is good? But while we're in this mortal body, we still have to contend with self. And because everything that man does is done out of self-interest, it it incorporates sinful structures into everything man does. Nothing that man creates is good. And man opposes what is good because it makes him look bad. Remember the first murderer in the Bible? Cain, the, the two sons of Adam and Eve, their first two sons. Cain killed his brother Abel because Abel did what was right in the sight of God, and Cain didn't, and therefore Cain hated his brother Abel because Abel made Cain feel bad and look bad. Cain, Abel was accepted, Abel's uh, sacrifice was accepted by God, and Cain's wasn't. So Cain decided to get uh, rid of this problem that made him feel bad by killing him, killing his brother Abel. The first murder. Self. Say self is the godless self is a radical distortion of what human, uh, human beings are supposed to be. We are to be the, the dwelling place of God. If God is not dwelling in us, we're dead, spiritually dead. We are wicked because all that we have that remains is directed towards the desires of self rather than toward the desires of God. And this permeates the all the structures uh, sinful human build, uh, beings create. Those things that were created by God, like marriage are not bad. What God does is always good. What godless man does is always bad. And being born again, salvation, which requires the cross of Christ, and it's only in Christ, is the only way that God can be recon we can be reconciled to God. God reconciled us to himself through the cross. 
And only in Christ and his cross can be, we be restored to a proper relationship with God where we can do good and be in relationship with what is good rather than hostile toward it. So we see this manifested all through society and through the governments of man, the institutions of man. They are always, they always flow out of this self-centeredness, the desire for self. Um, you see it manifested all around. And it, 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 it will take, in its most unrestrained forms, the form of tyranny and Orwellianism. You must all conform to my wish. And it even uh, creates this in democracies. The tyranny of the majority, the, the found, so-called founding fathers, were concerned, and you know, they created a representative system, a representative system uh, rather than a pure democracy, because they were afraid of the tyranny of the majority where there's a Bill of Rights. Because democracies can do the same thing as other tyrants can do. They can go Orwellian. And, and during times of stress, like war, you will see this. Democracies go totalitarian. They, they go extremist. They, they uh, will destroy others in their own society, because they're, they're a threat to their self-interest, to those in power, including the majority. Democracies are... The, America committed acts of genocide against the Native Americans. It's a fact. Israel is claims to be a democracy, and look what they're doing. One of the crazy things about what they're doing, what's totally self-destructive there, as a side note, the, the Zionist entity, which is probably, I don't want to call it Israel, really, because that's a biblical term, and I don't want to call it Judaism, because or the Jewish people, because a lot of Jewish people do not support, maybe a minority, but they still do not support what's going on, and they, they very well may not uh, believe in the Zionist project that is the state of Israel. But what's going on there under Netanyahu, well, it's going on in the past too, but it was not as obvious and as blatant and in your face, uh, in some ways because social media didn't exist. The people that are being killed nowadays can actually transmit their plight out on social media. And one of the, there's a, something that's not going too good on that. Too. But uh, look at California right now. California is, a, is an Orwellian totalitarian state because a particular party has a supermajority you have the governor and a supermajority in both houses in the state of California. And they've gone absolutely nuts. And repressed dissent. See, we do this individually. If somebody, there, there are people, why don't we like certain people? You know, we're talking about personal things. We, we don't like them. I'm not, we don't. Because what? Because they're contrary to us. They're contrary to our interests. We see this in politics. Hatred. Hatred. Because they have different ideas than I do. They have different goals than I do. And it's hard. As Christians, we have to battle with that. In our, because it's in our flesh. We have to confront that in ourselves and say, when these ideas rise up, I don't like them because. We have to remind ourselves we follow Christ, not ourselves. We're at war with ourselves more than anybody else. It's the flesh. 
It's the worst thing we have to confront with. But we, I was, the depths of this, the, the, the flash, the fallen humanity that we're all born into, as Jesus said, you must be born again. We're all born, as he uses the expression, of the water, of the flesh, out of the womb. Dr. Nicodemus and Nicodemus, remember, Nicodemus had said, am I supposed to get back into my mother's womb to get me born again? So he says, you must be born of the water and the spirit. It's not baptism he's talking about. Read in context. If he meant baptism, he would have said baptism. He's talking about natural birth. And he demonstrates that in the next line where he says, that which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. That which is produced by the children of Adam also known as the children of disobedience, which is what Paul calls the flesh. We're all born of that originally. Are bad. Alienated from God, and which means to be alienated from all good. And the scripture is very plain. We'll see, see it in Proverbs that even the plowing, the man out plowing his field, even his act of plowing is wicked, is sinful. Why? Because uh, it's, uh, uh, the plowing of a sinful person, a person that's not reconciled to God. Because he's, the motives, he's doing it out of self-interest, not out of good. Plowing isn't sinful, but doing it out of self-interest is not something that is good because good comes from God. He's not doing it out of love, faith, and hope. Love of God, love of his neighbor. He's not doing it for others. He's doing it for himself, solely. His highest motivation is self, satisfying himself. That's why John Piper, his system, his, well, he's faded off the scene, thank God. His Christian hedonism was, was totally self-centered. wasn't Christ. He just had a, a complicated way to deceive himself and, and justify his own self-centeredness. Very sophisticated. Deceived a lot of Christians. If you simply read his introduction, you know where it came from. His ideas didn't come from Scripture. It came from semi-Christian or philosophers like C.S. Lewis, semi-Christian. Okay, but this, this is all through everything, and we see it, including Christianity or churchianity. All these structures man built. In other words, everything that's not part of the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. The denominations. Uh, the structures that were developed. The, the priesthood. Not the priesthood of believers, but the priest, a special sacramental priesthood. Uh, all, these, all these things, whether they're called Christian or they're not called Christian, are manifestations of the sinfulness of man. The worship of Mary. In other words, sinners would rather go to Mary than go to Christ. Because Christ is the judge. He is God. They want something more friendly. Joel Osteen, manifestation. This is absolute anti-Christian Christianity. Because it's all about self. Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement. It's about self. It's about power. It's, uh, if you've been around it long enough, you know it's about power. The power to get what I want. The name it and claim it. Prosperity gospel. That's what it is. And Joel Osteen stuff. Although he's not really, well, his father was a Pentecostal. But Joel Osteen, he just strips all that away. It's just down to self-interest. How can I use God to get what I want? John Piper is the same message just clothed differently. 
Self-interest. The Flash. Adam. Every war, every murder, every theft, all sin is an expression of putting yourself above the will of God. It's the spirit of Antichrist. That's what the Antichrist does. Paul talks about the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. He puts himself above God. Interesting that he says it does it in the, house, in the temple of the Lord. This is what we see manifested in Christianity today is the spirit of Antichrist. People putting their interests above the interests of God. Joel Osteen ism, John Piperism. How can I get do get God? Uh, how can I use God to get what I want? Piper wanted happiness. Joel Osteen followers want happiness. Joyce Meyer's followers want happiness. Their personal happiness, not God's happiness. Their happiness. And it's a man that this is what Paul talks about is a man of sin or the man of lawlessness which is really the, the sons of Adam, children of Adam. My will rather than God's. How many people out there who call themselves Christians or are called Christians can actually say the Lord's Prayer, which is under assault again in the Anglican Church now? Thy will be done on earth in my life as thy will is done in heaven. Putting themselves in the hand of God, saying, Lord, not what I want. As Jesus said during his, the, the, uh, the night he was betrayed, in the garden, three times, Father, deliver me from this, if it be possible. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. His human flesh, sinless though it was, was recoiling from what he was about to face. To be, to die. His body was going to die. His humanity would die on that cross like a man. And he, our sin imputed to him. He would die as an offering, a sin offering. But nevertheless, he said, if it be possible that, that there's some other way, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. If you've listened to the prosperity gospel preachers long enough, you know they say, never say that. Because it's all about our faith getting what we want. It's sorcery. They believe in the power of faith, not the power of God. This is, this is you know, these are rather gross examples of anti-Christian Christianity. In fact, the very word Christian and Christianity has become useless, I think. Sort of like evangelical. It means nothing. If a word means everything, it means nothing. How do you distinguish yourself from the vast majority of what's called Christianity? Because it's not of Christ. Roman Catholicism is not of Christ. All those things that you see there, there, there is some remnants, some shadows of what Christ brought, you know, the sacraments. But it's been grossly distorted. Grossly distorted. All the stuff you see, the priests and the altars and the, the images, and it's not just Roman Catholicism, is not from God, but from man. Same thing would apply to Orthodoxy. Same thing would apply to fundamental Baptists. I'm going to get, which is probably... The people that would be, should be most like what I think, but, but you can see there's there's the flesh dominates so much of it. 
They would rather engage in culture wars than pro proclaiming Christ crucified, the Southern Baptists. They would rather fight about things internally. There's nothing so carnal as the Southern Baptists and the ba Southern Baptist Convention. I was a Southern Baptist pastor for a short period of time. I'd look in the denominational newspaper and I'd you got to be kidding me. One group suing another group over who controls this property or that property. Constantly. Wars within the denomination. Methodists. The Baptists and the Methodists were the, the great evangelizers. They were out in the frontier preaching Christ. Well, the frozen chosen on the East Coast did what they did. The Presbyterians and the, the Anglicans. What's both of them? The Methodists and the Baptists were all, all turned aside. Especially the Methodists. There's other smaller denominations, but those are the same way. Evangelical Methodists. They're not evangelical anymore. Evangelical Lutherans. <laughs> well, Lutherans never were very evangelical as far as proclaiming Christ crucified and seeking to make him known to the world. In the United States, they've been pretty much insular ethnic churches. They've tried to get over that, but they're still trying... Uh, I, I know the uh, one church I investigated as a potential church to, to go, go to because the preacher there actually does preach Christ crucified. But the denominational structure is anti-Christian. The, the, the breaking point, you know, I, I could, you know, well, this is not the liturgy I remember. And, you know, but they're more serious. They're, the worship is more serious. And, and I could, some of the stuff... And the music was chosen because it was Christ-centered. This is all pastor-determined. But the denomination stuff was, I can't worship with you because I, I can't go to the Lord's table because I'm not a LCMS member. It's the Lord's table. No, it's not. It's, it's not the Lord's table. It's a denominational table. So they set themselves off from the body of Christ. Talk about not discerning the body. It's not the piece of bread. That only represents something. Just like the Passover bread, which is what Jesus put in his hand, represented what God did bringing his people out of bondage in Egypt. It represented their heritage in him. And when you turn it into something else, where it is, it is Christ himself in some way, and by physically eating the bread, you, you get the grace of God. The, what Paul talked about is not discerning the body. Is the, the context was Christians were not acting like Christians when they gathered together and shared a meal together. The ones, the wealthy ones, or, or some would bring lots of food and they kept it for themselves while they had brothers and sisters in poverty that didn't have anything to eat. So they were selfish. They were manifesting selfishness. And he said, that's why God is judging you. Because you don't come together for the good, but for evil. They were manifesting the flesh. Getting drunk. at the Lord's table. And yet, you know, I, I, I did all say all this to the pastor, but he can't change anything. I could tell he, 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 he could understand my point of view. But he has to defend the denominational position. So that was a deal breaker. I mean, there's no way. I, it's like... In spite of things I do like about it, there's things I don't like about it, but the, you know, it's like, okay, 
the, the, the thing that did attract me was not because it's Lutheran. I'm not a Lutheran anymore. That died when I when Christ saved me. Because that's of the flesh. Denominationalism is always of the flesh. Seeking security in numbers and a name other than Jesus Christ. The manifestation of the flesh permeates everything that man does, including in Christianity. Everything other than what God himself has done. It's all contaminated by that sin, by that original sin, that original selfishness that was a result of the spiritual death of Adam and Eve. It's, well, like red pilled. <laughs> it's like, oh. So what are we to do? There's been many attempts to restore first century Christianity. They've all failed. I'll tell you why they failed, too. You know, you had the American Restoration Movement. The Churches of Christ, Christian Church. Uh, you had the, the followers of the, the Campbellites followers of uh, Thomas and Alexander Campbell. Uh, there are a lot of them still around, especially in this area. Um, you see a lot of them in Texas. You, and, uh, the Stoneites, uh, there was another guy named Stone, and there were some other guys on the East Coast. It was sort of a, a, a thing that popped up all over the place in the, the first decades of the, the, the United States of the, uh, of the uh, 19th century freedom of religion, all kinds of things popped up. And one of the things that popped up and glommed on to that movement was the, the Mormons. The Latter-day Saints claimed to be part of the Restoration Movement, Restora uh, restoring true Christianity. Well, there was nothing Christian about the Mormons. But many Christians, they claim to be, and many people think they are. It's a lie. It's a lie. People say, well, I know somebody, he's a Mormon, he's a really nice guy, they have a good family. So? How do you think Satan appears? He appears in a business suit. Or appears uh, wearing a, uh, a, a nun's garment, doing good deeds. His purpose is to separate you from God, and, or to keep you separated from God, from Christ. Mormon church has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. They believe in, they have nothing to do with, they're not monotheistic. Muslims are much closer to Christ than Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses are monotheistic. They deny the deity of Christ, as do Muslims. But I think Muslims do it mainly out of ignorance. Not that Jehovah's Witnesses attract much followers from knowledgeable Christians. But it's, I'm, I'm amazed at how many people are tempted, how many people are try to argue with Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, why? Because the, the, they're actually afraid. You know, it's like all the debates and other things you see, it's, it's all fear-based. It's all of the flesh. It's not about proclaiming Christ crucified and risen again. It's not about preach about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's fear. So much of what Christians do is out of fear. It's like uh, the, the, the uh, unregulated immigration, illegal Im immigrants. How should Christians be responding? Not out of fear. And not listening to these people that, that say, oh, such and such came in and he's a murderer. They're all murderers. Now I think more Americans commit murders in America than illegals. By proportion. 
unless you're talking about the, the criminal drugs gangs. It's, it's, it's self-centeredness. that dominates things. And you, you see it all kinds of places among Christians. Racism among Christians. Oh, it's not open. It's, oh, I don't like them. They're different. You see it in all kinds of unexpected places. See, see, we all have flesh. And we, get, we have to be watchful because it'll try to manifest. You'll see somebody and you'll, you'll feel these feelings rising up. They're not one of us. They're different. But it's not, it's not coming out of love and concern that they're not, they don't belong to Christ. It's coming out of the flesh. Our struggle, our primary struggle is with ourselves, our flesh. Adam in us. Our natural life. But as I said, the, the, it's like, wow, red-pilled, how this sinfulness, this self-centeredness that's present in all humanity contaminates everything humanity does as humanity. Only God's works are good. And as in religion, what calls itself Christianity, everything that was not instituted by God is evil. It's about power, it's about control, or it's used for that. Rome has often used the, uh, uh, the ability to withhold communion and baptism as levers to control countries and kings. They've used the confessional for evil. They've used all kinds of things, but these are things that God didn't institute. He didn't institute the priesthood, a special priesthood. He did not inter, inter, God did not establish the papacy. It's all man's work. Every denomination is man's work. It's of a name, and they set themselves apart from others. See, they don't see the body of Christ. Some denominations deny it. They deny the universal church of Jesus Christ. Oh, it's just our assembly. It's our group. But they have a whole group, a bunch of standards that Jesus didn't establish. A confession Jesus didn't give. Rules that Jesus didn't do. Distinctives. Get back to fundamentalist Baptist. Baptist distinctives. Oh, you can't be one of us unless you hold to our distinctives. What sets us apart from the rest of the followers of Jesus Christ? Well, the question is, are you following Jesus Christ if you do that? No, you're not. It's manifestation of flesh. But will the churches face that? No. I was going to, be, going to say something about the Restoration Movement, the, the, the attempts to fix this. Well, the Restoration Movement, what they did is they stripped away a lot of that stuff, but they went back to the form, the external forms of Christianity, the Lord's Supper and Baptism, and uh, uh, the, the name on the sign, Church of Christ, Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, but they forgot the substance. They denied the necessity of the new birth. Christianity was reduced to a rational thing. See, these were followers. Uh, Alexander Campbell was heavily, heavily interested, um, influenced 
by John Locke. which made his movement sort of popular in the very beginnings of the United States because the, the founding father of America, the philosophical foundations, were laid by John Locke. A rationalist, a deist, of an enlightenment thinker, but in a Christian apostate. His parents were Puritans. He rejected it and became worse. More recent movement, the, the house church movement, same thing. Seeking to reestablish the New Testament form without the reality of the new birth, without the power of the New Testament. Religion, fo religious form without the power, without Christ himself. The, f the form is not important. Christ is important. Christ in you is what makes you a Christian. Not how you assemble together. And they got that completely backwards. Because those people that did that that were looking, well, the Bible says we should do it this way. They end up as legalists. You see that among the Reformed Baptists all the time. They become theonomists. James White is a f admirer of, of a guy named Boot. What's his name? Who is a theonomist? Joseph Booth, this is like the Bible of Apologia Church. This guy's a theonomist. He's not a Christian. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The new covenant is not law. It's not about how you do church. The assembly of the saints has to be in the name of Jesus. We come together because we belong to him. And if we come together on some other basis, it is we are not assembling as his church. It's not hard. It's just, where do you find it? See, Christianity has gone so far from Christ. We're into everything else. We're into culture wars, into politics. That is all apostasy. It's all of the flesh. It's exchanging Christ, who is king and Lord and God and Savior, for in preference, uh, giving preference to the works of men over him. There is no government on earth that is good because only God is good. And Christ's kingdom has not come on earth except in his people. Jesus said in one place, he talks about the coming of the kingdom, not referring to the final coming, but he says that the kingdom of God does not come visibly to be seen which is what I've been saying for quite a while. The church is invisible. Necessarily so, because the king is invisible currently. He said, it's not, you can't say it's, it's here or it's there, because the kingdom of God is within you. You must be born again. Christ the king has to be in you. Anything else is a lie. But the house church, again, they, they mis mistook the form of the New Testament church, gathering in houses without a clergy. Fine, no problem. But that isn't the reality of it. That isn't the substance of biblical Christianity. Christ is the substance of biblical Christianity. What kind of building you meet in is not particularly relevant. 
there are biblical things that make certain things less desirable than others, like a mortgage and power structures and, you know, a house church, you don't need a clergy. Why? Because you've got a handful of people. Everybody knows everybody. If somebody's having problems, everybody knows about it. You don't need deacons. They were added. You don't need elders. They were added later. Paul established churches. He didn't appoint deacons and elders. He had Timothy go back later near the end of Paul's ministry and said, make sure you go back and establish, you know, appoint deacons and elders. Because a small church doesn't need it. You don't need to hire a pastor. But nevertheless, they'll do it. It's evil. You hire a person you don't even know to come in and do what you're supposed to be doing. Well, that's not a probably a, a, not really a Christian church to start with anyway. I don't know. I think we should just give up on the word Christian. Maybe just use like disciples of Jesus. Followers of Jesus. People that belong to Jesus Christ. People who have been purchased by Jesus Christ. Maybe the world might wonder, who are you then? Are you Catholic? Nope. Are you Lutheran? Nope. Are you Protestant? Nope. Are you Orthodox? Nope. I belong to Christ, not an organization. Church isn't an organization, it's his body. The, he dwells in his body. And rather than following Christ, we're more concerned about Trump and Harris, which are both of this world, as this government is of this world, not of God. The United States has never been a Christian nation. Unless you measure it by the majority of Americans happen to be somehow associated with something called Christianity. When has the United States ever followed Christ? Which war did they conduct in his name? Have they treated others like Christ would treat others? You want to call America a Christian nation? You've got a really bad idea of Christ and what it means to be a Christian. Because this country is something else, as is every other country. The kingdom of God currently is in heaven. But it will come to earth when Christ returns. <sighs> I don't know where these videos are going to go when I start, but it is the pervasiveness of the sin. There is nothing good in this world. The world, the flesh, and the devil are things every Christian has to contend with within themselves. Are we going to let these things control our lives, or do we allow Christ control our, to control our lives? There's a lot of people, some people out there have come to a form of Christianity recently. People like Jordan Peterson and Candace Owens, at best, these are immature Christians. I'm not going to say whether they're born again or not, but what I hear coming from them does not indicate a mature faith. They're in, they seem to be in love with the idea of Christianity. The, because they're, they see the world coming apart. They see America coming apart. And like Constantine, they're looking for something to glue their lives together with. So a lot of them turn to Roman Catholicism because that is the biggest thing out there. But it's not Christian at all. The Pope is an antichrist. He is, he is, what does he have? Even Catholics recognize that the Pope is not a Christian. He's a pagan. 
His agenda is not the agenda of Christ. Even Catholics are seeing that. I pray that Catholics who see that will begin to follow Christ rather than being concerned about their institution because salvation is in Christ, not in an institution. The lie that salvation is in the Roman Catholic institution has deceived many. Why? Because in the interest of the institution to promote itself as a Savior rather than Christ. The sin again, self-interest. The lust for power, the lust for worship of yourself. We could ask the same question of every candidate for president. What are you really interested? Is it in your own personal power? Your personal fame? Your desire for worship? You love to be adored? You love the, the people out there chanting your name? You're seeking power over others? They manifest the flesh, everything they do. They're not followers of Christ. Follower of Christ puts Christ's interests above their own. And that's a struggle. There is no easy Christianity. Jesus said the road is narrow and it is difficult. It's constrained. It's not an easy path to follow. Because of the world, the flesh, and the devil. you've got some other Christianity, if you've got happy, 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 well, I'll tell you what, there's a huge difference between joy, which is a fruit of the Spirit, a gift of God, and happiness as humanity seeks. Different things. John Piper never found that out. His pursuit of happiness, self-centered pursuit of happiness. Bizarre. See, sin twists things and twists people in strange and bizarre ways. It manifests itself in many different ways. And the, uh, the exalting your own will above everything else as in 150 assorted genders. Whatever you can imagine, you can be. Self-centeredness. And, and some of these things are uh, still psychiatric disorders. Things like uh, uh, people that are psychopaths or sociopaths, which I understand is not an actual category, but it's basically the same thing. Where you're you're so, so obviously self-centered that you're incap incapable of empathy. I've seen some Christians like that, or self-identified as Christians. I'm thinking of one uh, particular apologist out there um, named Wood. That, that he thinks you, you spread the gospel of Christ among Muslims by insulting Muslims, Islam, and the Quran. It's insulting Muhammad. I don't know what's wrong with his, but he has a history. Before he became a Christian, he had a, well, legal history. Severe. What would be called a psychiatric disorder. So he has to contend with that flesh, and he's not contending very well. A, a, a psychopath has, gives, because they have no empathy, they are unconcerned about others' feelings at all. They have no concern. It's just... Uh, 
among fundamental or uh, Reformed Baptists. We had a recent example that was not quite so extreme, but the lack of empathy and uh, well, he confessed he had a, a milder form of something like that. These so-called psychiatric disorders are just just various manifestations of the fallenness of man. All sin is a manifestation of the self-centeredness of fallen man, putting myself above everything else, including God. All sin, all sin is rebellion against God. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And yet thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, all the law and the prophets hang. Supported by that. They are, they're all simply applications. Everything else is nothing but an application of those two commandments. In particular, different contexts and everything else. And when you commit adultery, are you doing it out of love of your neighbor? And love of God? When you steal, are you doing it out of love of your neighbor and your love of God? Anything that is not flowing out of the love of God and the love for your neighbor is sin. Christ must be in you or you can do nothing but sin. Everything you build will be sinful. Everything you work to achieve will be evil. Because God is not in it. And only God is good. The only answer we have to that is Christ. Christ must be in you. You must be born again. Through faith in Jesus Christ. God must save you. 